And we're going to talk today about why some buildings fall while others survive, and we're going to take an example from the 1985 Mexico earthquake. So hopefully it will be an example of things that you might do here, and sort of the way that we think in engineering. So, let's see. All right, as I said before, well, there's something up here, but... I'm an associate professor of engineering, I'm in civil engineering, so this is the Jenkins building, it's um, where the civil engineering, most of the civil engineers are based. It's the original engineering science building in Oxford. So right now we're in this called Tom Tower. If you walk to the north, you'll see it. And at the crest of it, it was built at the beginning of the previous century. There's a statue of the boy on the torso, it's sort of an unofficial symbol. And it's an early 20th century representation of the youthful engineer taming nature in some way. Um, I'm also, oh, sorry, uh, in civil engineering, I'm part of a subgroup. Uh, there's three subgroups. The first is uh, environmental fluid mechanics. Uh, the second is geotechnical engineering, and I'm a geotechnical engineer. And the third is structural engineering and materials, which is some example application. So uh, for fluids, these are some tidal turbines to use tidal power. In geotechnics, we do a lot of uh, renewables, and in particular, offshore wind turbine foundations. And then we have um, one colleague, for example, in structures doing retractable and origami structures. Now, this computer has messed up a bit my phone since saves, but I'm also um, a tutorial fellow at St. Catherine's College. So I don't know if you still have time, but if you do, drop by and have a look at St. Catherine's. It's a very nice, uh, welcoming college. It's if, you're, if you've got enough of neo Gothic architecture, maybe you'd like to see something modernist. Right, this is the end of my plaque, so let's go back to the talk. Um, why some buildings fall and others survive. And you see here a photo from the 85 earthquake in Mexico City. There was a lot of destruction there. Let's start by what happened. So we're the 19th of September in 85, early morning. The Cocos plate is pushing underneath the North American plate, and that morning an earthquake happens, the epicenter in Lazaro Cardenas, uh, which is over here at the coast, that's about 400 kilometers from Mexico City. So you would think that's far away, but actually, there were 10,000 dead in Mexico City, 30,000 injured, and about 250,000 that were left homeless at the end of that earthquake. So very destructive. If I were to take a very big knife and make a section from uh, Lazaro Cardenas to Mexico City, this might be what it looks like. So we have here a fault, which is the source of the earthquake. One side of it is moving relative to the other. You have a rupture forming, and that's propagating. It's sending seismic waves all the way to Mexico City. So Mexico City, you can see over here, if the pink color is a rock, it's built actually on what used to be a lake. So it's a lake that gradually got filled with lake deposits. So it's a very soft ground, and the city is on top of that. We'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. Um, there was surprisingly small damage at the epicenter and enormous damage uh, in Mexico City, but it was concentrated in a small part of downtown. So huge damage, but not very large area. These are some photos from what happened. So over here you have um, a 10, 12 story uh, building fully collapsed. And that was the case for a lot of buildings of that size, but then you had a lot of taller structures, like this two that you see here, that might seem more vulnerable, that survived with no damage. So the question is, what happened? Why some buildings were so damaged while others were not? And if you look at the statistics of what happened here on the y-axis, you have the percentage of buildings that were damaged, and on the x-axis you have the number of stories of the different buildings. So that you'll see that most of the damage was buildings 10 to 15, 20 stories, buildings that were uh, smaller than that, not much damage, buildings that were taller than that, not, not much damage. So what we want to do is, can we understand why that was the case? And that is a very complex problem because earthquakes are complex phenomena, buildings are complex structures, but Often we have to deal with very complicated uh, questions in engineering, and what we tend to do is um, we try to simplify the problem as much as we possibly can, while we still maintain the fundamentals of the question. 
And then we use what we know in maths and physics to try to come up with an answer. So this is what we will try to do today. So let's take one of the buildings from the big previous picture. Slightly better, better picture now. Uh, so this is a complex 3D structure, but what if I were to simplify it, make it 2D, simplify it by taking all the mass and concentrate each, mass, each story's mass along the slab, which is what carries most of the mass, and then concentrate all of the stiffness, which is uh, what opposes the movement of one story relative to the other, to just a column. So I've taken this complicated structure and simplified it a lot by doing that. Now, what about the earthquake? By doing something that is 2D, I'm essentially assuming that the earthquake is just acting along one direction. In reality, it's acting along three directions. But this is sufficiently uh, good simplification. Now, the earthquake is important in acceleration, and as you'll know, force is mass times acceleration. So why if instead of applying whatever acceleration the earthquake is doing, I'm just going to apply the same acceleration to all masses, so the same force to all masses. How would that simplified structure that I created be formed? It might look something like that. And whether it will be like that depends on the height of the building, but let's say for now it is. Actually, if we were to do something more complicated, the more sophisticated 3D analysis, you would end up with something similar, which I did with finite elements, and that's what you get out. So this sort of profile is not too far from the simplified assumption we made. This is still quite complicated, though. We still cannot really solve it by just thinking of what's happening. So let's go one step further. This thing look, looks like something that's bending, like a ruler that you might apply a force and it bends. So what if I were to actually concentrate all of the mass at one point, and then just have something that is fixed at the bottom and can bend? So now I created what we call a single degree of freedom system. So all I'm allowing as a movement is just horizontal displacement here, and all I'm getting is bending like a ruler would bend. So I've come from a very complicated 3D system to something very, very simple here that we can use to explain what happened, what happened. And you'll see that we maintain all of the fundamentals of the things that we're interested in seeing. So let's take that system. We just allow some displacement u at the top, and that system has a, a height of, let's call it L, L, P, the length of that P. I'll do a free body diagram, which many of you will have already seen. So I separate the mass from the beam. First I look at the beam. I have deflected it by U, which means I need to apply force for that to happen. And you need to trust me on that. The, the displacement you get is the force times the length cubed over 3 EI is the stiffness, and I, the second moment very has to do with the geometry of the beam. So if you were to come here, along in the first year, you would do a course in bending and torsion of beams, which you would do with me, <laughs> and then you would, we would explain why that is the case. Uh, now the same force has to act on the mass as well, so it's a uh, action and reaction. So you get the same thing on the mass, I just rearrange this formula and I get that my force is equal to minus this grain factor that I will just name k, times the displacement. So at K, it looks like a stiffness. If you think about it, it looks like a spring that I am uh, deflecting, I'm, I'm pulling it, and I get a restoring force acting in the opposite direction. So essentially this system, this whole system, which corresponds to the whole building actually, is not very different from a mass on a spring that you might have seen before. So that's what we'll, we'll use to try to explain what's happening. So we'll take this mass and we know that the force is minus some stiffness times displacement. We have acceleration, though, during an earthquake, and you also know that force is mass equal to mass times acceleration. So if you combine these two, then you get what we call an equation of motion. So here you have mass times acceleration plus stiffness times displacement equals zero. This is uh, an ordinary differential equation. Some of you might have seen how you can solve that. But for those that haven't, this is something that you would see in your first year as well. So I'll just rearrange it to make it a bit more useful for what we're doing later. So I just named something omega n, which is a root of stiffness over mass. And this is what we call um, the angular frequency of the system. Uh, so I have this equation. It's an ordinary differential. I want to solve it. Just by looking at it, you'll be able to identify, maybe not all of you yet, but in your first year, you will be able to identify that 
This is what the solution for Latin equation looks like. So if you were to plug that back in, you'll see that this works. So you have A cosine of omega n, so the natural rotational frequency, angular frequency, uh, plus B sine omega n t. Um, I can differentiate that and get an expression for velocity. So that, that describes the movement of my system, but I still have these parameters A and B. What are these? How can I define this? So when you have a differential equation, what you need to define is the initial conditions. So the system, depending on how you start, so how much you deflect it at the beginning and what velocity you give it, will behave in a different way. So if you have your time equals to zero, and you know your initial deflection and your initial velocity, then you can relate this to these parameters A and B. If you plug everything back together, you get this function that tells you what your displacement is as a function of time, and you have it here, the initial displacement, the initial velocity. If you don't have any initial velocity, so you just deflect it and you let it oscillate, it's just a cosine. So let's take this function and plot it. This is what it will look like. So here I've given some initial displacement, some initial velocity. So the displacement is over here. The slope is the velocity. And then you get a harmonic motion. Now that harmonic motion has a period, it has what we call a natural period, Tn, which is 2 pi over omega n. So omega n is useful because it relates to the natural period of the system. That's why we defined it before. So that's what this system will do. And if you were just to take a metal ruler and deflect it and let it oscillate, that's more or less what you would do. Now, that's fine. We know what the system does if we are to displace it and let it go. But that's not quite what happens in an earthquake, is it? So um, the useful part of the information that we need to keep from here is that there is this natural period. Now, if we think about what happens in an, in a, in an actual earthquake, the ground moves. So you have a displacement of the ground, and you also have a deflection of the beam. And the total displacement for your mass is going to be equal to the, deflect, to the displacement of the ground plus the deflection of the beam. So if I go back to my equation of motion uh, and I try to write what's happening for an earthquake, then for the term like, that is acceleration, so mass times acceleration, here I need the total displacement. Because the, the mass is actually moving as the total displacement tells it to move, so that's the acceleration it's experiencing. But when I get to the term for stiffness, this is equivalent to the restoring force you had for a spring. This only cares about the deflection of the beam. Think about it, if you have a spring, you will only have a restoring force if you are to deflect. If you have a spring, you have a restoring force if you are to deflect the spring. If I move the whole spring around, it don't get any restoring force from the spring. So that's why when you get the stiffness, you need to deflect that beam to get some force out of it. So here you have total displacement, and here you have the local displacement. The total is equal to the ground plus the local, so this is what it looks like. And I can just rearrange that to get this expression. So now we are back to what we had before, and then I have some term on the right-hand side. What I have on the right hand side is mass times some acceleration, so that is acceleration at the ground level. Mass times acceleration is time some kind of force. So I can just write it as what I had before, the same equation that I had before, equals some force, a function of t, some external force. And in this case, for the earthquake, it happens to be mass times the ground acceleration. So essentially what I've done now, by writing this equation in that way, is that I'm saying instead of studying that system on the left, I'll study something that is a bit simpler, which is that system on the right, where the base is fixed, and instead of moving the base, I'm just applying the force at the mass now. So that gives you the same equation as if I had an earthquake. So we simplified a bit more, but we're still studying the same problem. So now what we have to solve is this. This system with an external force. So let's look at that. I'll make things even easier for me and I'll assume that this external force is harmonic, it's some sine function. Okay, so that's what we have to solve now. Again, this is something you'll see in ordinary differential equations. Some of you might have seen some things about it, others you will see it in the next year, but the way to solve it is that 
We have a complementary solution, which is just the left, just looking at the left hand side, and it's exactly the solution we had for the previous system, where it had zero on the right hand side. And on top of that, we add what we call a particular solution, which is we're looking at the right, right hand side now, and you start with a function for you, which you look at that to think about what it should be. Again, you don't have to know this, this is something that you'll learn in your first year maths here, but um, this is what it will look like in the end. You just start, start with some u is equal to some c times sine of that omega t, and this is what you end up with. If you add these two, you get this long equation. We will look at it in a moment, so I don't expect you to know how to derive it, but we will look at what it does in a moment. So, um, in this equation, you have two types of omega. You have the omega n, which is the natural frequency that comes from the system without the forcing function. It's what the system will oscillate at by itself. And you have the omega, just omega, which is the one from the forcing function. So this is the frequency with which you impose uh, that force. If I am to plot that, this is what it looks like. So you have this dashed line, which is a steady state response, and that is at the imposed frequency of omega. So this comes from that term over here. And on top of that, you have superposed an oscillation, this higher frequency one, at the natural frequency, which comes from these first two terms. So you have the system oscillating on its natural frequency on top of the imposed um, frequency from the force field that you're applying. So in this case, you can see that the period of the imposed force is longer than the natural period of the system. If I, you, you can do that, you can take the system that you have and change the frequency of the imposed uh, force, and you'll get a different amplitude for the maximum displacement. So if I look at just the amplitude of the maximum displacement, this is what I get now. If I were to repeat that with a different uh, frequency for the force that I'm applying, I would get something different. So let's look at what that looks like. What happens when the imposed frequency is the same as the natural frequency? This is what the system response will look like, where in this case it will start oscillating, and with each cycle the amplitude will increase and will keep increasing forever, and actually it will go to infinity. If I were to draw a graph where here on the x-axis I have the frequency ratio, so the omega that I'm imposing over the natural omega, and on the x-axis, I have the magnitude of displacement. So you can think about looking at, <laughs> we're looking at one system, and here we're imposing a low frequency external force, and here we're, we're imposing a high frequency external force. When I go to one, I have what we call resonance, and this will go to infinity. If I have something that is uh, where the external force is lower frequency, there will be something lower as a displacement, you have something that's higher frequency, it will also start dropping. Now, this is a bit idealized. Real systems don't really don't go to infinity. Real systems have a bit of damping, so if I'm to display something, it will gradually reduce its amplitude of oscillation and will eventually stop. Uh, the way we introduce damping is we have this extra term over here. We make damping to be um, a function of velocity. I won't go into how we solve this equation, but this is again something that you will learn. I'll just go into plotting the solution for it. So it started out very similar to what we had before, but now because of the damping, the oscillation at the natural frequency gradually dies down, and then it follows what we call the steady state response, which is at the imposed frequency. What that does is that when we go to resonance, so when omega is equal to omega n, instead of going to infinity, it goes to a maximum value, which is related to how much damping you have in the system. So this is capped now. If I were to plot the same graph that I had before, now for a different values of this zeta, which is a damping ratio, uh, you don't need to know what it is, but as that increases, we increase the damping, instead of going to infinity, we now have a maximum value, which drops the more damping I introduce to my system. Reinforced concrete structures, like what we're looking at, have a zit of about 5% is what we usually take, so they do have a set, certainly have a very pronounced peak. So, that's all very interesting, but let's take one of these, um, uh, of these curves and try to 
think now about the problem we had to deal with for. So we thought about this up to now. We have our oscillator, so our one degree of freedom system has some omega n, and we were changing the frequency that we were applying, we were changing the omega. What if we think about it the other way around? So now we have we impose a certain omega, and we're changing the height of our oscillator, which means we're changing our omega n. How would that change? So this is a system that we have. Remember that the stiffness is a function of the length or the height. So the taller this is, the lower the stiffness. The lower the stiffness, the lower the omega n, and the higher the natural period. So if I have a given omega here, and I'm just looking at the denominator, um, the more I increase my natural frequency, the more this ratio decreases. Which means that a short oscillator will correspond to some low ratio of omega over omega n, and a tall oscillator will correspond to a higher ratio of omega over, over omega n. So if, I, if I'm imposing uh, a forcing force, uh, if I have a forcing function, this force that I have a certain omega, for a very tall oscillator, that won't displace too much. If I'm looking for a very short oscillator, that won't displace too much. But whatever oscillator happens to be here, will displace very significantly. Right? So let's try it out with my very homemade experiment. So I just have some bits of metal. I'll just plug them in this foam. And I'll put some play it in, in a color that you can hopefully see above them. And let's see if that works. So I oscillate at a certain frequency. And let's see, here at this frequency, well, the middle one is resonating, the other ones are not. If I go to high frequency, then I can make the small one resonate all day one, the other ones are not stuck much. If I go to a very low frequency, when the tall one resonates and the others are not really moving that much. So this is essentially what we're doing here, and this hopefully starts to give you a good hint of what we're trying to show uh, when it comes to buildings. So let's go back to the earthquake. Uh, this is a section of the city. Mexico, as we said, it used to be a very, the whole area used to be a very large lake. This is where Mexico actually is. Gradually it was filled with these um, soft deposits. This is what it looks like now. We had most of the damage in this area where this deposit has a depth of 40 meters. We had a record here, the SCT record. This is the acceleration time history there. Um, we'll think about the deposit in a bit, but for now, we have a record at the surface. We have a range of different buildings. Uh, the way to see what happened is to do a graph of spectral acceleration. So what is this? On the x-axis, we have the period of the system. So you can think of that as um, we have a series of oscillators. As we said, we're increasing their height. That changes the stiffness. And uh, the higher we go, the higher the natural period of the system. So these x values correspond to the natural period of these oscillators. What we do then is we subject them to this earthquake record here, this acceleration record. We subject all of them to the same acceleration record, and we see what is the maximum acceleration that we record for their mass. And we plot that on the y-axis. We did this for all oscillators, and this is what we get. So that, for that particular earthquake, what happened is that these oscillators over here that have a natural period of two seconds, they experience very high accelerations. High accelerations means that they have high forces, so high forces in a building equals a lot of damage. So Perhaps the buildings that the, air, the, the type of building that got destroyed would have been the one that experienced very high forces, so buildings that were in this area, period, natural period of about, of about two seconds. Now, what are the natural periods of reinforced concrete structures that we would expect to get? This is what you get in a textbook. So, things that are 10 to 20 stories have a natural period of one to two seconds, but this is if they're founded on rock. If you have a soft soil foundation, that makes the whole system, system a bit softer, so it, increase, it increases the natural period a bit more. So you, this type of building ends up, being, ends up having a natural period of two seconds. So we end up experiencing very high accelerations. 
And it's actually these buildings and these, for these number of stories that experienced most of the damage. So hopefully this now makes sense why some buildings were very significantly damaged, where others were not. They were all subjected to the same earthquake, but depending on the height, had the different natural periods, and some resonated well, with the earthquake, while others did not. Uh, now, let's go back to that. I have a bit of a question for you to think about, which you can answer with what we've uh, already said so far. So I said in the very beginning that the damage was very concentrated in a small area of downtown Mexico City. It was very much the case, and that area was somewhere over here. So the depth of that uh, deposit, the soft deposit, was about 40 meters. Somewhere further out, we didn't have the same amount of damage. So maybe with what you've seen now, with the oscillator and its height, you can think about how that same type of analysis might relate to what happened with the soil deposit in here. Right? So in reality, these buildings were particularly unlucky because they suffered the double resonance, soil deposit plus building resonating with the earthquake. Um, now, why is this relevant? Uh, this is very much still an issue. We had in 2017 another earthquake, same location uh, for the record. Uh, again, high uh, accelerations of slightly lower periods, which means slightly uh, shorter buildings. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still had buildings. But it's not as slow as now. <laughs> so this is during the earthquake. Right, so this is still very much an issue. This is actually a school that collapsed uh, in the 2017 earthquake. So using this very simple tools that we have today, we can actually have very good insight on what might happen in this part of the city, and we can get rather good estimations of where we need to invest and what types of buildings we need to protect, and that could actually end up saving people uh, from these events that will inevitably happen again in the same locations. So um, that's more or less what I had to say. So just to wrap up, what we did today is we took a problem that might seem quite complicated in the beginning, but we used our knowledge in physics and maths uh, to uh, try to understand how a very, a very much simplified version of that problem works that still retains all of the important information for the actual buildings and the actual problem. Uh, and this is the type of thing you would be doing if you are to do uh, the engineering course here. Uh, you would start with problems that are real-world problems, quite complicated, but you would learn the tools that you can use to simplify and come up with actual answers for these problems. Um, so my presentation has no lots of fun. So that was it for me. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.